there's like two levels to this, which is to remind people who were alive during that time. And for those that are listening that maybe were very young or too young to remember or weren't weren't born yet, right? Because it's been, what, 20 years ago now. So certainly a generation is growing up with having not remembered 9-11 or remembering that invasion or knowing about it. Um, If you could remind us a little bit of what the kind of atmosphere was in the United States... There was so much propaganda. It's hard to, it's easy to forget almost because it kind of went away. Well, went away is, is maybe not the right way to say it, but it, it's like the veil was lifted slightly. People kind of acknowledge at some point 20 years on that it was a bit of a disaster, that it was a bit of an awful thing that happened. Now, they might have all kinds of rationalizations about it, but, you know, I think some of the initial stories and narratives that were being constructed and pushed in everyone's face I mean, that was that was a hell of a time to make a decision to do what you did. So I'm curious, like, yeah, what was your, rem- how do you remember that time? How do you remember what it was like for people to, to hear you say, I'm going to Iraq to talk about it from the ground as an unembedded journalist? Well, the level of propaganda was so intense. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, turn on CNN and there's, yeah. A picture of, you know, the graphic of the outline of Iraq and then right in front of it, you know, uh, transposed over it is a photo of Saddam Hussein with a big bullseye on him. Mm-hmm. And like that was the lead. And then let's bring in the news. And gee, I wonder how they're going to talk about this war. I mean, <laughs> right. like yeah, a high school kid could make better propaganda. But mm-hmm. if you're going to dumb it down to the average news consumer in the country at that point, it's worse today, of course, than that's what you have to do. And that's what they did. And Mm -hmm. but it wasn't just CNN and the usual suspect corporate media. Of course, it was also the New York Times with the famous stints they did with Judith Miller and other op-ed writers. And and it was really uh, just a level of propaganda that I found personally deeply insulting. It was almost as though if you turned on any of the mainstream news during much of the buildup, it was like an arms manufacturer show, uh, mm-hmm. you know, cruise missiles. Let's here's this detailed computerized mm-hmm. version and let's show you all the specs and then show video of it, you know, going into buildings and such. And it was just literally a frenzy, an orgy of war weapons, um, celebrating violence, the the might of the U.S. military and and no facts, no critical thinking, no, if you read that news and then held it up against what, for example, was being reported in the Independent at the time in the UK or the Guardian or other international media, English speaking or not, Mm -hmm. uh, it was two completely different stories. You know, there was, there were, there never were weapons of uh, mass destruction. There was never a link to 9-11, any of this. And yet that was being trumpeted out in the corporate press ad infinitum. I mean, they were just, they were ad nauseum, I should say. There there was a parroting of the Bush administration propaganda that was practically verbatim. The mm-hmm. White House didn't need its own press corps at the time. They didn't even need a spokesperson because the corporate media did it for them. And despite the fact that huge numbers of the people the, of the people in this country opposed the war, that was evident that February before the war was launched with the, the at the time, record-breaking protests globally, uh, it, it went on, you know, anyway. And so, yeah, the level of propaganda was really um, mind-numbing. It was, it, it, it really had my head spinning at the time. And, and then you look at what's happening today with the 20th anniversary coverage, and um, it's, it's kind of a tepid admission in some cases of, oh, this was a horrible mistake. It was a tragedy for the Iraqi people. But um, it, it's been dramatically softened, um, even, even in some of the a lot of the left media still lowballs the figures mm-hmm. of uh, dead and displaced Iraqi people. Uh, most of the left media still only reports it was 300,000 was a figure I was seeing. And you know, completely ignoring the second Lancet medical survey, which put it upwards of, you know, pushing a million. uh, And it's well over a million at this point, according to other surveys. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, that's just one example of this continuing to downplay the mistakes, the mistakes 
of the empire. I put that in air quotes mm -hmm. um, because uh, this was a deliberate war of aggression to try to just take control of a country to get its resources. Uh, it was a gross violation of international law. And it was at that time the most egregious example of what this country does when it hasn't ever come to terms with the genocide of the indigenous population that lived here before this country was formed. Uh, it hasn't truly come to terms with the slavery that built much of this country. Uh, and if it hasn't come to terms with those, and until it does, it's going to keep projecting that outwards. And Iraq was the most, at that time, the most egregious example of that. So it, it it really churned my stomach to see a lot of the 20 year anniversary coverage, even a lot of the so-called left-leaning media that uh, didn't go nearly far enough in talking about what was done in Iraq uh, in, in the way that it deserves to be discussed. Yeah. Yeah. It seems that a lot of times it's reduced to the economic impacts like it was uh, it was an extremely expensive war it put us in an enormous amount of debt um often if we talk about casualties it's the u.s soldiers or you know allied forces that were affected by um by by yeah basically occupying this sovereign country um so you know if you could maybe frame it as well around once you were in Iraq and you were reporting on the ground and as things began to disintegrate over time, well, I mean, one of the most egregious examples that comes to my mind, and, and please, you know, correct me if I state this incorrectly or um, if there's more you'd like to add to this, of course, but uh, when you were reporting on the, I think there were two sieges of Fallujah uh, and the crimes that were committed by U.S. soldiers there was not being reported in u.s media and so i mean there were there were certain aspects of what was going on on the ground that just was also part of the continuation of the propaganda that was so egregious even in comparison to the initial forms of propaganda that you know tried to get u.s population support of the war um it was such a disparity it's it's really striking i mean if there's some examples there you could describe of like what Iraqis were actually experiencing what was actually happening on the ground versus what the U.S. public was being told. Well, you're right. Fallujah is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, not to, get, to go linearly in time. I think I'll probably no. be all over the map. But sure. Um, I broke the story during the second siege of the Fallujah of the U.S. military using white phosphorus there, which is uh, a weapon that is uh, it's illegal to use it under international law if the military uses it in a place where there could be civilians. In the Pentagon, at the beginning of that siege in November 2004, admitted itself that there were up to 35,000 civilians in Fallujah. There were far more than that, but they even admitted to that and then went on to use this weapon. So that's an mm -hmm. egregious Mm -hmm. uh, violation of international law. And there's a lot of other examples that I'll talk about. But long after that siege happened, uh, you know, and I, I reported on that story. I, I wrote about it. I talked about it in um, a lot of the lefty media that I was doing radio reports for and TV at the time. Um, and then it came and went. Uh, mainstream media in the U.S. wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole because it's a war crime. And they're among a heap of war crimes that the U.S. military committed in Fallujah, that siege and the April siege. Years go by, and I came across a book by a photographer who was um, working with the New York Times. I can't remember his name. And um, he was attached. He was working with Dexter Filkins, who was a reporter with the New York Times. That They were embedded with the military, and they went into Fallujah as embedded reporters uh, um, during the November siege. And in that book, he talked about uh, being with uh, Dexter Filkins and the whole New York Times crew uh, with the military and literally at times having um, little fragments of white phosphorus falling on their backpacks. And so you've got a New York Times reporter literally with you know, tiny little pieces of white 
phosphorus falling on uh, his backpack and that of his photographer who never reported it. Mm. That, that I think says so much about yeah. the corporate media's role, not just in the selling of the war, but then the soft peddling of the occupation. Uh, meanwhile, this was uh, a siege that literally uh, I saw with my own eyes, mass graves had to be dug in the aftermath uh, with bulldozers filled with bodies of people that were killed. Uh, there was no discerning uh, civilians to fighters, uh, women and children, et cetera, uh, just like there wasn't in the April siege where I saw with my own eyes uh, women and children who had been shot very, very recently by snipers who were literally shooting everything in the city, watching a young boy bleed out on a table as Iraqi doctors worked to try to save his life. Uh, women who were shot, older folks all around the city at different times coming in, saying the same thing that we are, you know, you can't leave your home or you will be shot. I had friends that went out in, in an ambulance to try to pick up wounded people or dead bodies. Uh, and, and they were Westerners and uh, the ambulance was shot and they literally mm -hmm. had to duck down into the floor of the ambulance and barely made it out alive. And we're lucky at that. Um, uh, collective punishment, all water and electricity cut in the city for both sieges, collective punishment, uh, no medical care being allowed in, no wounded people being allowed out during both sieges. Any of that that happened was happening underneath the radar. So uh, those are just some broad brushstrokes. Yeah. And then, of course, there's Abu Ghraib, uh, torture, humiliation, beatings, uh, Iraqi prisoners being sodomized with broom, broomsticks, things like this. Yeah. This is what the empire did in Iraq, just, just off the top of my head. Yeah, there was several points in the book where it became, where it, was, it was obvious that you had an indication of some broader, deeper crisis. Like what you mentioned Abu Ghraib, I think earlier on in the book, you had gotten notified about a man who was in a hospital um, who had been tortured to the point where he was in he was in shock. You know, I don't think he could speak or he could hardly move at all. Um, he obviously was the victim of torture. And um, I think you mentioned you tried to feed this information to larger media outlets in the U.S. Like, hey, this is happening. This is a story. I don't have enough information to write about it as much, but you know, to get it out there. But you can definitely, you know, you were you were trying to get this information out there. You were giving them lots of information it seems at certain points i was i was naive enough uh <laughs> at the start to think that that would have been uh a success i mean that really just kind of shows how naive and overly idealistic i was i was literally just trying to get the truth out there in any capacity i could i didn't care about my name or or mm -hmm. money or any of that it was like people have to know Mm -hmm. this because i really genuinely believed that if people knew better they would do better and mm -hmm. uh so i was that was one example but yeah this man sadiq zoman uh was a bathist and he was captured and uh basically beat into a coma and then given back to his family and there he was and there was nothing that they could do at that point and I was amazed that you had doctor's reports, had photos of him, had literally gone and sat with him and his family and wrote up the story and and just thought, wow, look, this is, if we're going to pretend to be a, a country that ad adheres to international law uh, and paints itself as the good guy, then um, we've got some things to answer to. And it was really uh, obviously a fool's errand. Uh, it, it obviously didn't pan out, but that along with so much of the rest of my reporting i hit a point though where it did become clear that uh this was not going to change the situation um it, it wasn't going to stop the occupation uh but i i basically was exposed to that quote from the famous israeli journalist amira haas who uh did very very honorable reporting from gaza and the west bank for decades and um, someone mm -hmm. at one point asked her, why do you keep doing what you do? Things only keep getting worse year after year, decade after decade. And she said, well, 
so that at the end of the day, when history is written, uh, no one will be able to say uh, that they didn't know. No one will be able to say uh, nobody told us this was happening. And that kind of became my de facto motivation for from fairly early on when I became extremely dispirit, dispirited seeing, seeing story after story come to pass and nothing changed only to get worse. I had to find a deeper moral motivation to to keep doing the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that that would have also led you and informed you to after and this is sort of jumping ahead a bit, but you know, when you got to the point where you left behind that type of reporting and started covering the environments, the climate crisis, that the idea that, uh, that we, we all know that this is happening, but the idea that anything's going to stop, you know, climate change from continuing as it is, um, you know, is it, sort of pursuing the truth for the sake of knowing the truth. And so this is kind of what I wanted to pivot to is this discussion around truth. And there's a couple levels to this. So there's the level of now that we're two decades on from this invasion and occupation and the uh, kind of consequences of that, you know, this legacy of what this war effort has had on our concept of truth in the United States. Now, certainly we can go back even further and see the ways in which truth is sort of the social construct and what is considered the truth in the U.S. context has always been fantastical on some level or illusory. But, you know, we have had instances where the truth, you could say, due to intrepid journalism, has broken through some of those illusions and certainly on some level played a part in the sort of shift in the public consciousness around the war in Vietnam, for example. Um but uh, I think the war in Iraq is a very, it's a very particular example. I think of, of how. I mean, I, I just, I just really want to appreciate. I guess I'm kind of having a hard time articulating this, but I really just want to appreciate how the trajectory from 9/11 to the war in Iraq to the present moment we're in now. Where I remember when Trump was elected, and he of course lied compulsively about everything, flagrantly, with no shame. Right. He still does, of course, but um, people were like, we've entered into the post-truth era. It's like somehow truth died, you know? Um, and I'm like, I think it died a long time ago in this country, you know? And I think especially with what you experienced leading up to the war and your decision to go and report in Iraq and the ways in which the truth as you were reporting it was not being picked up by the media, the, the, the ones with the larger audiences, right? So I'm curious about this concept of truth and how you feel this uh, this idea that we're in a post-truth era now really relates to your reporting in Iraq. Uh, <laughs> how does that hit for you? Right. No, that's a that's a very interesting point. Um, it, it's it's interesting because uh, your question really kind of confronts this year zero mentality of whoever kind of coined the term of being in a post-truth era, mm -hmm. because as you point out, uh, I can't think of a war the U.S. ever got involved in that wasn't based on a lie. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can go back a lot further than Iraq or Vietnam, uh, even when the U.S. decided to enter into World War II. You know, I mean, yeah. there's, there's not ever been a whole lot of truth involved when it comes to the U.S. government. Um you know, Vietnam, just using that, because there's a lot of people have made comparisons to Vietnam and Iraq, at least um, during during the Iraq, the hot war that was going on. And, uh, you know, Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin, you know, the whole thing there was also based on another lie. So, um, I, but I think one thing that Iraq did in, in the Bush administration and their propaganda around the events of September 11th, uh, and then using that to kind of start to build momentum for the propaganda effort for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, while certainly truth was was already a, a casualty at that point when it came to the U.S. government and the corporate media, I would say that the Iraq war was a pretty significant erosion of whatever may have been left of, of the foundation of truth in in um, in that realm of the media in this country, that uh, any pretense of 
legitimate media, not being military stenographers, not being White House stenographers, uh, was gone because the the level at which they adhered to the government line uh, was exactly the level at which they had abandoned reality. And, and that really, I would say, it didn't by itself set the stage for this era that we're in today where it's mm-hmm. you know, exponentially more off the charts. Um, but it certainly played a significant role in setting, it's creating the conditions where people became increasingly normalized to um, untruths and getting just come to expect kind of this instilled cynicism of coming to expect that anything coming out of the government's not going to be true, which uh, a critical newsreader already knew that, you know, as the great journalist Martha Gellhorn said, decades and decades and decades ago, all governments are bad and some are worse. (laughs) Uh, so any thinking person understands that Mm -hmm. uh all governments lie period full stop yeah um uh, it's just some do it far far worse than others um so uh but all that is to say that i i think the egregiousness of iraq the fact that more than a million iraqis were dead uh are dead as a result of that and continue to die in instability and violence and despicable living conditions across that country, millions displaced internally and externally uh, in a country that's essentially a failed state today. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, That with that happening and that kind of being thrown into the dust bin of unmemory in in the dominant culture in this country, um, I would argue that Things wouldn't be as bad today on these fronts if if it weren't for what was done in Iraq and then how that was um, set up to be perceived to the American public by the government and the corporate press. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's um, I, I think there's a way I can maybe draw a connection here and segue into this next point I really wanted to get into, which is more of a personal point. Because again, knowing you and having known you for these years, reading Beyond the Green Zone, I, I imagine you were about my ages, uh, but you're, you were about the same age in that time as I am now. Mm-hmm. So mid thirties about, right? Yeah. Like 20 years ago. Cause there's about a 20 year difference between us in age. So imagining you 30, you know, at 34, 35, whatever age you were with, you know, the, the knowledge that I have of you my relationship with you. I could hear your voice as I'm reading it. There's this, what's incredible about the book is it is a fine piece of reporting, but there's moments where you take asides, you take a moment to say, at this point, I was so beyond burned out. (laughs) I was fried. Every time I heard an explosion, I would shake or I, you know, I would, I would, you know, just sort of describing the scene uh, and the the mood and the, the feeling you were, you were in at that time. Describing how you, yeah, you you made, I think it was what, you were in Iraq at three different spans of time, if I remember correctly. Like, is that correct? Like the first several months? Yeah, for yeah. for that, for the first book, that entailed mm-hmm. three different trips. Okay, okay. Yeah. So at certain points, you either left back for the US or you went to another, you know, country. Like I remember mentioned going to Jordan, if I remember Jordan, correctly. Yeah. yeah. So... You described the trauma of that experience. I mean, anyone who witnessed what you did, of course, would experience PTSD. But you also had, and I just want to talk about this very particular form of trauma because it has to do with this idea of truth. You were able to leave. You had that ability. You had a certain privilege that people in Iraq really didn't have. That You could leave. You could fly back to the U.S., and you could come back. And you, and I could just only imagine what that must have felt like. You just left basically what was the frontier of empire right the spear tip of the occupation of the of what the u.s empire actually is and it's all its ugly truth you come back to the belly of the beast you're back in the 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 womb of the united states so to speak where it's kind of safe it's comforting everyone's going to their jobs you know everything's functioning on some sort of institutional and infrastructural level that you just couldn't have in iraq 
and you decided to go back. <laughs> and there's a particular kind of experience there that I would, if you, if you could speak to, because I think it speaks to this idea of truth on some level, um, what felt true, what felt real, what was actually in reality. Um, even with all the comforts of modern, maybe U.S. life in 2003 or whatever, um, <laughs> he felt like, no, I have to go back. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah, I was experiencing what so many soldiers experience. Uh, and I, I don't use Iraqis as example, because as you pointed out, importantly, they couldn't leave. Yeah. If you had an Iraqi passport still to this day, it was arguably a bit, a little bit worse than it's still horrible, but you know, your travel was extremely limited to put it very diplomatically. So talking only about my experience and people who could freely go in and out of the country by choice. Um, it is horrible as things were in Iraq and as traumatizing as it was to experience what I had, you know, had, I had been shot at, I'd had car bombs go off, uh, right adjacent to my hotel and blow my windows out and blow my door in and part of the ceiling falling down on me and, and, uh, being temporarily detained a couple of different times by not even sure who the people were, mm -hmm. you know, I, I definitely had plenty of trauma. Um, uh, in addition to seeing really, really horrible uh, deaths and uh, what had been done to bodies, et cetera. Um, but as horrible as all of that was for me, it was real. And coming back to the United States, especially uh, a year into the occupation, you know, mm -hmm. six months, a year. I remember I came back out. Uh, it was after my um, second trip into Iraq, which was when I went into Fallujah in April 2004. And it was an extremely intense two-month trip. I saw a lot of shit mm -hmm. and was in some really dicey situations, several. And... Uh, I was in there for that trip. And then two days later, after coming out of Iraq, I'm in Manhattan. Uh, the folks I was writing for at the time, I was staying with them in their apartment. They were running this little progressive news website. And um, I just, it was like coming into the matrix, right? As you described, people are yeah. just, hey, what do you want on your pizza? You know, that <laughs> yeah. Iraq didn't exist, you know, mm -hmm. and and I remember just at one point uh, I just like went and sat on their fire escape and smoke just started smoking cigarettes. I don't smoke normally, yeah. but during Iraq, I smoke like a friggin chimney um, yeah. and I just went out there and just started chain smoking and mm -hmm. and then just, you know, reading news, you know, about what was going on in Iraq from some sources that I trusted and then just like, couldn't wait to get back. And I just didn't fit in anymore to yeah. this culture of it's based on denial, lies, superficiality, mater rampant materialism, consumerism. And it was absolutely crazy making. And I was in severe PTSD. Um, I couldn't really feel anything beyond numbness and rage you know, kind of typical, like what you hear from veterans, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't, I wasn't really aware at the time of how bad a situation I was in psychologically. And I just knew, well, it made a lot more sense to be back in Iraq. Uh, and, and it was, it was really hard because you have to live with, uh, if you choose that line of work, um, that unresolvable, disparity of you know as you pointed out i got to leave you know yeah. my interpreter his family all my other iraqi friends and people that i knew and cared about in there and had become very close with very quickly they couldn't leave and i can yeah. remember distinctly getting on that plane in baghdad airport and flying out and uh literally feeling the relief of getting out of the hell and the danger and then simultaneously literally the guilt and the shame of that i got to leave you know it's yeah. it's just it's it's not fair it's not right it's not just 
Um, and, and you, I carried all that in me, you know, and, and I think part of me will always carry that in me, you know, but it, it was a, it was an unresolvable situation then. And I would say that it still is to an, to a, to a large extent. Um, I have, uh, uh, a couple of different indigenous elders in my life and, and one of them, uh, hardcore Vietnam vet uh, was long range patrol in Cambodia when we weren't in Cambodia, killed mm-hmm. a lot of people, had a lot of friends, died right in front of him. And he lives with his wife in a tiny little village in southern New Mexico. Um, and it's good because uh, things probably would not go down well if this guy had to live in a heavy population center. Yeah. And um, I really identify with him in that. Mm-hmm. I live uh, in uh, a house by myself in um, the woods in uh, on the north coast of the Olympic Peninsula. And I I describe that sometimes and say, yeah, but I do that for a reason. Yeah. Um, because it it's it, it, there is still part of PTSD, at least for me, is there is still an agoraphobia. It's like crowds make me nervous. You know, I've, I've been real close to car bombs. I've been stuck in intense traffic jams when car bombs were going off mm. almost daily in Baghdad and it makes you crazy and paranoid. And so I don't, I don't really like, I still don't really like that. You know, I mean, there's, yeah. there's certain parts of it that um, you just kind of learn to live with. And, uh, and, and I think that's increasingly becomes a crazy making experience when we live in this dominant culture where um you know, back around to what we're talking about, like the average person to this day has no idea what went down in Iraq, you know, and that's a real shame. And Mm -hmm. until people can really, really come to terms with that and, and, and what that means to live in this country that has done that. And again, going all the way back to the genocide of the native Americans here, that uh, until that can be come to terms with, in our hearts and and intellectually, uh, where are we, you know, as a people, you know, if you personally ran around and killed someone and then never made amends, never felt guilt, uh, you'd be a sociopath, you know, you, yeah. you should be locked up. And, you know, how can you not say that about this, the government in this country? 